Well, hello again and welcome to a special edition of Something Artsy and we are on the stage at Martin Luther College, uh, commonly referred to on campus as the Wittenberg Collegiate Center, do I have that right? Yep, or yep. the auditorium. <laughs> and our good friends out in New Ulm have been here for many, many events and they have a show coming up that is absolutely a great, great Agatha Christie mystery and it is the longest running show in the history of theater. It's The Mousetrap. And that's coming up later in February. But with me right now are the two directors and the producer, and I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Katherine Curtis. Um, I'm one of the directors for The Mousetrap. I'm from Palmetto, Georgia, and I am a secondary social studies education major here at Martin Luther College. Hi there, I'm Elizabeth Duff. I am an elementary education major here at the college. I'm from St. Paul, Minnesota, and I am the producer of this show. And I'm Katie Ginterberg. I'm from Appleton, Wisconsin. I'm the other director of the show, and I am a secondary English education major here at the college. <laughs> Well, Elizabeth, we had you on just a, a little bit ago. You're, you're on TV right now somewhere in the schedule <laughs> on the Something Artsy show. And Katie, we had you on two years ago, I think, last, last with year. Elizabeth yeah, and Elizabeth. Holly Marquardt. And what, what, did, what show we were, were we talking about then? Uh, we were talking about It's a Wonderful Life. Oh, yes, yes. That's right. And Catherine, you're kind of new for, for me and for Something Artsy. So... T Tell me, you know, the, the, the show, Agatha Christie is well known as, um, you know, um, Witness for the Prosecution, I think, is hers. Um, and then there were none, or the Ten Little Indians sometimes was, the name kind of went back and forth. Mm -hmm. This here, this show, how long has it been running? I think it's the Royal Theater yep. in London. How long has it been? Uh, over 60 years. Over 60 yeah. years. Wow. And it actually is kind of rare, Elizabeth, to see this show being done somewhere. Why is that? Yeah, well, just because it is such a big, important show, it's really hard to get the rights to this show. Like, you have to make sure you reserve them well in advance and just make sure people in the area aren't having it uh, so you don't end up in a rights war with people. <laughs> yeah, we talked about that on Something Artsy, that royalties or rights to a show, um, you might not be able to get them because a, a touring show, a, a professional show, might be coming through Minneapolis, St. Paul, so nobody in a you know, three, four hundred mile area can get the rights to them, or somebody else is doing it within uh, 120 miles of you, and therefore they don't want you to get, it gets a little complicated at times. Yeah. So, Catherine, you're, have you done some stuff on stage before becoming a director? Um, I'm very involved in the backstage for a lot of MLC productions. Um, I typically am in the, either the ticketing office or I'm in charge of hair and makeup, which is um, my favorite section of uh, theater because you get to do a lot of fun stuff, I think, and you're involved with the play without actually being on the stage. So you're now helping them in how they, not just how they look on stage, but how they act. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I love that aspect of directing where you like help them build the character and help them like you know realize like why they do different quirks or like how they say a line and like what they're actually meaning when they're saying the line because um, I don't know like especially with acting or like any form of communication it's not just like what you're saying it's how you're saying it and I think like as a director like that's one of the most important things to help your actors realize is the why they're saying it so that they know how to say it. So, Katie, what are some of the things as a as a co-director that you do to 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 help your actors or to coach your actors on on what Catherine was just talking about that line delivery um, in theater and um, moving from point A to point B on a on the stage is called uh, blocking, and then what you do if you're standing at a table that's called business. So, what do you what do you do with with the actors? Well, because you guys, yeah. here's the thing, you guys are all equals. You're all, yeah. you know, freshmen, sophomore, juniors, seniors here at college. You're all kind of equals. And now you're telling them, no, you got to do that differently. <laughs> well, what we do is we try to have a logical talk about things. And we sort of say, well, this is what you're saying in this line, but this is what you're actually talking about. You may be talking about 
for example, in this show, someone's talking about going and baking a pie, and they're not talking about going and baking a pie. They're talking about the state of relationships in the house. Um, and as far as blocking goes, something that I personally love is making sure that everyone in the scene is working together as a cohesive unit, because if one person is just sitting and everyone else is being active, that's not gonna look right. So making sure everyone is working together naturally is something that's really important uh, for us as a director pair and for the cast. So they all understand that. We just have a discussion about it and be like, hey, so. <laughs> uh, John Wayne, you know, arguably was the greatest movie actor meaning box office draw in the history of, of Hollywood. And a lot of people are critical of his actual acting. I think he was a very good actor. But one of the things he was taught very early on is acting is merely reacting. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a case of whatever the line is delivered, then it's re the, your reaction to that. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's exactly how it is. There's so much reactionary stuff in this show where one character will be talking for large portions of a scene and everyone else is just listening and reacting in an appropriate way is something that's incredibly important. Well, Elizabeth, um, in, a, in a murder mystery, there's always one person lying and everybody else is telling the truth. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. So it's just really fun to watch the actors just really build up their characters. Um, it's definitely something you wouldn't expect. I'll just tell you straight out about this show. <laughs> it's probably, probably someone you expect the least, but it's just really exciting because, you know, each minute as you're watching it, you're trying to figure out who is it, are, like, why would they be saying this, you know, what if they are the murderer, you know, what's the reasoning behind <laughs> saying this line, trying to fool people, so that's really fun to watch. You're lying to, it's probably who you, you expect the least. Well, that's true with every Agatha Christie. Well, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. matter who it is, you go, I would have never thought of her or him. Yeah. Oh, funny. Uh, Catherine, you're, you're now kind of in front of the house or of the stage working on things. What's, what's the biggest difference you notice from, you know, being back in the green room, helping them with costumes and makeup and things. Now you're out here sitting in the, you know, rehearsal up in the aisle seats. I think just like, just like how, like being like with the characters and like with the actors as they're like growing and just seeing that change. Cause being back in the green room, I only see the production after it's over. I don't get to see the rehearsals. I don't get to see how the the characters grow and how like the stage like builds itself. Like we finally have furniture, which is really <laughs> exciting. And we're gonna have our backdrop soon. And I don't know, just like seeing like all of the little pieces start stacking up and becoming like this huge magnificent thing. I think just makes me appreciate it more than just being in the back. And I mean, yeah, I gotta paint faces and stuff, but you know, I didn't get to see that growth. And I really think that's the coolest difference between being backstage all the time and being able to be out here and watching it happen. When we film this segment here right now, um, it, we're in January yet, so come show night, uh, things will be filled in a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, when is the show? Uh, our dates are February 17th, 18th, and 19th. So that would be a Friday night, a Saturday night, and a Sunday matinee? Yes, yes. And can I guess, 7.30, 7.30, and 2 o'clock? You would yep. be right with that. All right. Well, that's my memory from Sound of Music. Mm -hmm. And let's hope we can sell as many tickets as that night. <laughs> We're hoping. Uh, and what, what are tickets? I know they're very reasonable here. It's, it's not a deal breaker, but how much are they? Uh, tickets are $8 adults and $4 children. Uh, just a flat rate. Pick your seat as you come in. So. Okay. Come in early, good. get the best seats. <laughs> All right. Katie, Elizabeth, Catherine, thanks so much. I'm looking forward to this show. I've never done it myself. I want to do it, but uh, the very first time I saw it, I said, wow, what a neat show because it, <laughs> you're right. It's not who you expect. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's safe to say with any Agatha Christie murder mystery. So very good. Break a leg, guys, and we'll explain what that phrase means sometime else but everybody in theater knows what i mean <laughs> and we'll see you on opening night All right, and we'll see you at the mousetrap 
at Martin Luther College. And we'll see you around town. <laughs> I'm Jonah Backus. I'm from New London, Wisconsin. I'm studying the pastoral ministry here at MLC in New Ulm, and I'm playing the part of Detective Sergeant Trotter. I'm Zach Johnson. I'm from Cleveland, Wisconsin. I am in, in teacher track for secondary education with a focus on music, and I play the character of Major Metcalf. I'm Nick Blank. I'm from West Bend, Wisconsin. I am in the teacher track here as a sophomore. I am a history major with a mathematics minor, and I am playing Giles Rolston. I'm Silas Dose from Fairfax, Minnesota. I am in the pre-seminary track here at MLC with an emphasis in Spanish, and I'm playing Christopher Wren. Hi, I'm Aaron Schultz. I'm from Elkhorn, Wisconsin. I'm in the pastor track here at MLC, and I play the role of Mr. Paravicini. I'm Rebecca Figueroa. I'm from Ham Lake, Minnesota. I'm a double secondary education major here with emphasis in vocal music and English, and I'm playing Molly Ralston. I'm Olivia Prost from Watertown, Wisconsin. I'm an elementary education major here at MLC, and I will be playing Miss Casewell. Okay. Now think, Mrs. Rolston, try and think! I can't think, my head's numbed! Mrs. Boyle had only just been killed when you got to her. Now you came from the kitchen. Are you sure you didn't see or hear anybody as you came along the hallway? No, no, I, I don't think so. Um, just the radio blaring out in here. I couldn't think of who turned it on so loud. I wouldn't hear anything else with that, would I? That was clearly the murderer's idea. Or murderess. How could I hear anything else? You might have done. If the murderer left the hallway that way, you came from the kitchen. He might have heard you. He might have slipped up the back stairs or into the cellar. She held on me with information. You all held out on me. Well, Mrs. Boyle is dead. And unless we get to the bottom of this, there's going to be another death. Another? Nonsense. Why? Because there were three blind mice. Death for each of them. But there would have to be another connection. Some connection to this Lomax farm business. Yes, there would have to be that. But why another death here? Because there are two addresses in the notebook we found. Now, at 24 Culver Street, there is only one possible victim. Here at Monksville Manor, there is a wider field. Nonsense. Surely it would be a most unlikely coincidence that two people brought here by chance would both have a share in the Longridge farm case. As you say, People came, a lot of people from all different directions, all arriving more or less at once. Now, when I left through the front door to trace the telephone wire to the front of the house, you, Mr. Rolston, had gone up to the room you and Mrs. Rolston occupied to check the extension telephone. Where were you and Mrs. Rolston street? I was still up in the bedroom. Checked the extension telephone, but that was dead too. I looked to see if I could see if there was any sort of the wire being cut. Very well. Mr. Wren, I'll have your account of where you were. Yes, I'd been in the kitchen, help, seeing if there was anything I could do to help Mrs. Rolston. I, I, I adore cooking. After that, I went right up to my bedroom. Why? But it's, it's quite a natural thing for one to want to go to one's bedroom, isn't it? I mean, one does want to be alone sometimes. You went up to your bedroom because you wanted to be alone? Yes, and I wanted to brush my hair and uh, tidy up. You wanted to brush your hair. Anyway, that's where I was. And you heard Mrs. Rolston scream? Yes. And you came down? Yes. Curious on you, Mr. Rolston, didn't meet on the stairs. I went down by the back stairs, then over to my room. Did you go up by the back stairs, or did you come through here? Yes, I went down by the back stairs as well. Mr. Parvacini. I have told you. I was playing the piano in the drawing room. Uh, through there, Inspector. Did anyone hear you playing the piano? Uh, I do not suppose so. I was playing very, very softly, with one finger so. You were playing three blind mice. Is that so? Uh, yes, it is a very catchy little tune. Is it, how shall I say, a haunting little too? Uh, don't you all agree? I think it's horrible. And yet, it runs in people's heads. Someone was whistling it too. Where? Well, I am not sure. Perhaps in the front hall. Perhaps upstairs. Perhaps even upstairs in a bedroom. Who is whistling three blind mice? 
Are you making this up, Mr. Pavici? Oh, no, no, Inspector. Oh, I beg your pardon, sir. I would not do a thing like that. Well, go on, you're playing the piano. Oh, uh, with one thing or so. And then I hear the radio. It is playing very loud. And someone is shouting on it. It offended my ears. And after that, suddenly, I hear Mrs. Rolston scream. Mr. Rolston upstairs, Mr. Wren upstairs, Mr. Pavicini in the drawing room. Miss Casewell. I was writing letters in the library. And you heard Mrs. Rolston scream? Yes. What did you do then? I, I came in here. You say you were writing letters when you heard Mrs. Rolston scream? Yes. And you got up from the writing table hurriedly and came in here? Yes. Yet there doesn't seem to be an unfinished letter on the writing desk in the library. I brought it with me. Here. Hmm. Dear Philip, family member or relation? That's none of your damn business! Perhaps not! You know, if I were to hear somebody scream blue murder when I was writing a letter, I do not think that I would take the time to pick up the unfinished letter, fold it up, and put it in my handbag. You wouldn't. How interesting. Now, Major Metcalf, you say you were in the cellars. Why? Looking around. Just looking around. I looked into that cupboard place under the stairs near the kitchen. A lot of junk and sports tackle. And I saw another door. I opened it and saw a flight of steps. I was curious and went down. Nice cellars you've got. Glad you like them. Not at all. Crypt of an old monastery, I should say. Probably why this place is called Monkswell. We're not engaged in antiquarian research, Major Metcalf. We are investigating a murder. Now, Mrs. Ralston said she heard a door shot with a faint creak. That particular door shuts with the creak. It may be, you know, that after killing Mrs. Boyle, the murderer heard Mrs. Rolston coming from the kitchen and went into the cellar, closing the door to after him. A lot of things could be. There, there would be fingerprints on the inside of the cupboard. Mine are there, all right. But aren't criminals careful to wear gloves? It's usual. Tall criminals slip up sooner or later. I wonder, Sergeant, if that's really true. Look here, aren't we wasting time? There's only one person here who... Mr. Rolston. I'm in charge of this investigation. Oh, very well. Mr. Rolston. Thank you. Now, we've got to establish opportunity as well as motive. And let me tell you this. You all had opportunity. There are two staircases. Anyone could have gone up by one and come down by the other. Anyone could go down to the cellars by the door near the kitchen and come up by a flight of steps that leads through a trapdoor over there. The vital fact is that all of you were alone at the time Mrs. Boyle was killed. You speak as though we're all under suspicion. That's absurd. In a murder case, Mr. Ralston, everyone is under suspicion. But you know pretty well who killed that woman in Culver Street. It was the eldest of the three children at the farm, a mentally abnormal young man who was about 23 years of age. Well, damn it all, there's only one person who fits the bill! No! No! It's, it's not true! It's not true! I, you're all against me! Everyone's always been against me! You're, you're going to frame me for murder! It's persecution! That's what it is! It's persecution! Steady, lad. Steady. Nobody's against you, Chris. Tell him it'll be all right. We don't frame you. Well, then tell him you're not going to arrest him. I'm not arresting anyone. To do that, I've got to have evidence. And I haven't got evidence yet. Well, I think you're crazy, Molly. And you too. There's only one person here who fits the bill. And if only as a safety measure, he ought to be put under arrest. It's only fair to the rest of us. Wait, Giles, wait. Sergeant Trotter, can I, can I speak to you a minute? Certainly, Mrs. Ralston. Will the rest of you please go into the dining room? I'm staying. No, Giles. I'm staying, Molly. I don't know what's come over you. Please, let me go. 